see how we're recording. Okay, so again, we're in the, in our timeline. We're in the mid, the uh, early to mid fifties right now. Uh, so by the fall of 1953, the working hypothesis was that the flow of genetic information was from DNA through RNA and then to proteins. Um, Crick, so we're, we're talking about, uh, Crick here refers to Francis Crick. Uh, he's the Crick of, of Watson and Crick who solved the double-stranded, uh, the, uh, the structure of DNA as a double-stranded helix. So uh, that was done by James Watson and Francis Crick. Um, by 1953 in the fall, Francis Crick proposed what we call the central dogma of molecular biology. Okay, so in the central dogma of molecular biology, um, DNA can replicate itself. Okay, so we, we, we know that uh, DNA is a double-stranded helix and it can do uh, semi-conservative replication where one old strand is the template strand that it can be used to synthesize a new daughter strand. Okay, DNA can be transcribed into RNA. Okay, so we can get a Watson Crick base pairing between a DNA RNA hybrid so that DNA can act as a template to make an RNA copy. Okay, and then the information in the RNA is translated into proteins in the cytoplasm of the cell. There's still one important question left, though. At first, it was thought that RNA formed unique binding pockets for each amino acid. All right. Just like if you remember back when I was talking about, um, there was a big debate as to whether protein or nucleic acid was the carrier of genetic information. The prevailing sentiment at that time was that it was protein. Okay? And of course, that was proven to be wrong. The prevailing sentiment at this time was that the RNA, the messenger RNA itself, formed pockets that recognized each individual amino acid, each of the 20 amino acids. Most people believe this. Francis Crick, however, of Watson and Crick, he was like, no way, that, that can't be. Let's go back over here to the board. All right, so if we look at, let me zoom out so I can draw a little more on the board. Okay, so let's look at a molecule of single stranded RNA. So we have. Uh, I'm not going to draw the phosphate up there, so let's start here. Here, and that's enough. Okay, and here's the base. Of course, the bases can be either uh, A, U, G, or C. Okay, oh, and I forgot the two prime hydroxyl here. Okay, so here's a, this, a, a, a dinucleotide. So we have uh, an RNA molecule made of just uh, two nucleotides here. If we look at this molecule, so over here, hydroxyl, we have 
a polar molecule. Two prime hydroxyls down here, polar. Um, carbonyl in this phosphate, polar. Oxygen in this phosphate, negatively charged. Uh, same thing down here. So we have a phosphate, polar, negatively charged. Do you think that, what do you think that's going to do to the property of this molecule? So having a lot of charged and polar uh, functional groups, is that going to make this hydrophilic or hydrophobic? Anybody, anybody on Zoom want to? Hydrophilic. It's going to make it very hydrophilic. Okay, so um, we didn't look at the amino acids in this class. We did in biochemistry. But if we look at the different side chains of the amino acids, uh, there's a whole class of amino acids that are hydrophobic. Okay, so how do we take a very hydrophilic molecule like this and make a binding pocket for a hydrophobic amino acid that's specific enough to recognize that amino acid? Okay. Francis Crick was like, no, there, there, there's no way that's just not going to happen. Also, let me zoom over to the other whiteboard, other direction. Also, a lot of amino acids share similar structures, and the RNA molecule would have to discriminate between these different structures. For example, let's look at two very simple amino acids. Um, can you guys see this? Yeah. Here's the structure of the amino, of the amino acids like glycine. Its side chain is simply a hydrogen. And Here's the structure for the amino acid alanine. Its side chain is simply a methyl group. Okay? So in order to discriminate between these two amino acids, the RNA molecule would have to tell the difference between a single hydrogen and a methyl group. Okay, and that's, that's again, Crick is looking at this and he's saying, there's no way. There's absolutely no way we can take a molecule like RNA and make a specific binding pocket that will discriminate between very similar amino acids, uh, you know, based on small functional groups like this. Okay? So Crick proposed that, again, there has to be an intermediate. There has to be some type of an adapter molecule that can read or scan the sequence of the RNA and then bring the corresponding amino acid into the, co the correct place to synthesize the protein. All right, so later on advances in radioisotope labeling of amino acids uh, led to the discovery of exactly such an adapter molecule. So it found that uh, amino acids are attached to a type of RNA molecule that came to be known as a tRNA. Okay, tRNAs, um, there are enzymes specific for certain amino acids that attach them to certain uh, mRNAs. And mRNAs in one of the four arms contain what's called an anticodon that can base pair with and recognize the uh, a codon located in the mRNA molecule. All right, so shortly afterwards, both mRNA transcripts and RNA polymerases were discovered, okay? mRNA transcripts, now this, you would think that discovery of mRNA transcripts 
would really put this to bed, okay? However, there was still a lot of controversy, and that comes from this 4% number, okay? mRNA transcripts are making up only 4% of the total RNA of the cell. Uh, scientists were arguing that there's no way that that's enough RNA to carry out all the protein synthesis that goes on in the cell. And, well, they're, they're, they're right and they're wrong. Um, we'll talk about this later on in the semester, but this 4% that makes up the total mRNA of the cell, um, the cell recycles it and it, it gets the most use it possibly can out of the mRNA. So the, the reason why mRNA is only, only makes up 4% of the total RNA is because the cell uses that those mRNAs for all their work. Okay, they're, they're recycled, used again and again. Um, there are polyribosomes that make the most use out of them. And again, this is something we'll talk about a little later in the semester. Okay, RNA polymerase was also discovered. Of course, RNA polymerase uses DNA as a template and makes the, uh, the mRNA copy that's exported to the cytoplasm and used as the blueprint for making a protein. Okay, but still there's another problem here. So how is it that only four nucleotides can specify 20 amino acids? So obviously there can't be a one-to-one -one code here where, where one nucleotide codes for a single protein. That, that would only code, or pardon me, codes for a single amino acid. That would only account for four amino acids. And a two amino acid, pardon me, a, a two nucleotide code also doesn't work because if we have uh, two nucleotides, so there, there's four different nucleotides. If we have two positions, so a two nucleotide codon, that's four nucleotides raised to the power of two for, for two positions. That means 16 different amino acids can be coded for. All right, we have 20 amino acids. So we're, we're still four amino acids short. A three nucleotide codon or a three nucleotide code for each amino acid uh, would give us 64 possible combinations. Okay, so four nucleotides, A, U, C, G, three positions, that's four raised to the third power, 64 possible combinations. This can account for 20 amino acids and we have a, a whole lot left over as well. Okay, so in, in the early 1960s, Marshall Nirenberg cracked genetic code and he not only did he confirm that there is a three nucleotide code for each amino acid, but he figured out what each of those three letter combinations coded for. Okay. This is another one of the classic experiments. Um, this is one of my favorite classic experiments because not only is it very elegantly done, um, it's, there was also a lot of grinding involved here, just a lot of doing the work, grinding it out. Um, the real breakthrough that allowed Nirenberg to, to crack the genetic code was that he developed uh, an in vitro system of protein synthesis. Yeah, I, I think we talked about in vitro before. You guys remember what that means? In vitro versus in vivo. So in vivo means something that happens in, in a cell, in a, in a living organism. In vitro happens in a test tube. Okay? In, in vitro in Latin literally means in glass. So Nirenberg, develop a, a cell-free method of protein synthesis. In other words, he took you know, cell extract containing ribosomes, containing charged tRNAs, um, containing mRNA transcripts, and he was able to synthesize proteins in a test tube uh, in the absence of the cell, outside of the cell. All right, this is where he did something really clever. So, he added synthetic 
mRNA transcripts to this cell-free protein synthesis system that he developed. So the first one that he developed was just polyurethane. Okay, so all it was was just U, 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 U. He added that to his cell-free expression system, and what he got out, the protein he got out, was a polyphenylalanine. So just F, 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 phenylalanine, 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 phenylalanine. Okay, so when you think about that, so we know that there's a, a three, a three nucleotide code. We have all U's, we got all phenylalanines. So U, U, U must be the codon that codes for phenylalanine. Okay, so Nirenberg and his group kept making more and more new synthetic mRNAs, added them to the cell-free uh, protein synthesis system, and just kept trying different combinations of synthetic mRNAs until eventually he cracked the entire genetic code. Okay, let's, look at this, let's look at this figure. Okay, so very, very famously, the, the first experiment he did was polyuridine and he gets a nuclear, he gets a, uh, a protein that's all phenylalanines. Okay, so UUU is the codon for phenylalanine. Okay, uh, polyadenosine. So, or not adenosine, uh, polyadenine, sorry. Adenosine would be the nucleoside. Uh, polyadenine. So polyadenine, A, 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 gives us a protein that's all lysine, 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 lysine. Okay, so AAA must be the codon for lysine. Uh, polycytosine, C, 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 C. Again, in the synthetic, in the cell-free protein synthesis system, proline, 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 proline. Okay, so C, C, C must be the codon for proline. And again, just kept doing this again and again with more and more complex synthetic mRNAs and eventually crack the entire genetic code. And here it is. Here's the final result of Nirenberg's experiments. Uh, 61 out of this of 64 three nucleotide combinations corresponded to amino acids. Okay, so remember with a, a, a three nucleotide code that gives us 64 combinations. Um, we only have 20 amino acids, so we have 44 extra combinations, right? What, what, what happens with those 44 extra? Well, a lot of amino acids are coded for by more than one codon, and then we have three that don't code for anything. Okay, so 61 out of the possible 64 3 nucleotide combinations correspond to amino acids, with most amino acids encoded by more than one codon. Okay, and the last three are what are called nonsense codons that, that code for nothing. So the genetic code is said to be degenerate because there is more than one codon for some amino acids. This actually works out really good because it accounts for something called wobble. So the third position in the codon, we can have non watson crick interactions between the nucleotide that's in the third position of the codon and the anti-codon loop of a, a tRNA. So this is how wobble works over here. So again, in the third position of the codon, in this case, G, G can wobble with a C. Uh, well, actually, G, G, C, that's just a normal, that's, that's not a wobble, pardon me. That's, that's the normal watson crick base pairing. Okay, down here is where we get wobble. Okay, if we have a, a G in the anticodon, in the third position of the codon, that can wobble with a U. Okay, again, C would just be um, regular Watson-Crick, Crick, uh, pardon me, regular Watson-Crick base pairing. 
Okay, so genes can wobble with U's. Um, again, this is normal. No, this is a wobble. In the third position of the codon, uh, A's can wobble with U's. Um, we can do an opposite. So uh, U's can wobble with A's as well. Or you can wobble with a G. And what's over here? I or inosine. So this is a, a non-typical um, nucleotide, inosine. Uh, this can wobble with an A, U, or a C. So if we go back and look at the genetic code, let's look at serine, for example. So again, it's the third position of the codon where we could get wobble. So for serine, it really, be because both UCU, UCC, UCA, and UCG all code for serine, if we happen to get wobble in that third position, it doesn't matter. We're, we're still going to get a serine because each of these three, you know, all four of these codons code for serine. Okay. Same thing for proline, leucine. So proline, first two are CC. If we get wobble over here, it doesn't matter. Leucine, first two are CU. If we get wobble in the last one, it doesn't matter, et cetera. That makes sense, everybody? Okay, so this is what's known as the degeneracy of the genetic code. Because we have degeneracy in that third position of the genetic code, that compensates for the wobble that we see in the third position of the codon. Okay, so remember that uh, 61 of the 64 possible combinations coded for amino acids. Three codons do not, UAA, UAG, and UGA. These are known as nonsense codons or swap codons. We find these at the end of an mRNA. So um, a long stretch of mRNAs a long stretch of codons in an mRNA without a stop codon is known as an open reading frame. Okay, at the end of an open reading frame, we have a stop codon or a, a, a nonsense codon. Okay, so one of these three occurs at the end of the coding sequence for a protein. Okay, the codon for methionine actually has double duty. The codon for methionine, AUG, also functions as the start codon. Okay, so this means that before any post-translational modifications are made to proteins, all proteins start with methionine. Okay, because AUG is, is the start codon, so it, it tells the ribosome to start making the protein also codes for methionine. So all proteins actually begin with methionine. Um, now, later on, we know that post-translational modification of proteins takes place in the ER and in the Golgi body. Um, sometimes the initial methionine is, is cleaved off. Um, this can happen in, in the ER in some cases. Um, but failing that, before any, any post-translational uh, before any post-translational modifications, um, all proteins start with the amino acid methionine. Okay, that takes us to the end of the nucleic acids PowerPoint. Does anybody have any questions on that? Anything we covered in nucleic acids before we continue? Okay, I forgot to pass this around at the beginning. So uh, this is just a sign-in sheet. So for those of you attending the class today, you can just sign that before you leave, please. Okay, if there's no questions on that, let's start the next PowerPoint. <laughs>
Okay, so I always found this to be a really interesting chapter. Um, next, we're going to talk about the importance of weak chemical interactions. Okay, so characteristics of uh, chemical bonds is uh, strength. Uh, atoms united by a single covalent or strong bonds always belong to the same molecule. Okay, so um, in this case, we're talking uh, exclusively about covalent bonds. So atoms united by a single or covalent bond always belong to the same molecule. Uh, weak bonds occur singly between molecules only fleetingly. Uh, weak bonds only persist when present in ordered groups. Uh, for example, hydrogen bonding in DNA. Uh, weak bonds have a longer bond length than strong bonds. Uh, for example, a hydrogen hydrogen bond, thank you, is about uh, 0.74 angstroms. Um, hydrogens held together by Van der Waals interactions of 1.2 angstroms. So um, hydrogen hydrogen bonds, that would be an example of uh, covalent bonds. Um, Van der Waals interactions. Of course, Van der Waals interactions are, are probably the weakest of uh, the intramolecular or interatom even intramolecular forces. So um, we get a, a longer bond length in that case. Just a second, let me. Uh, there's another one. Let's go back to the camera for a second. Oh, I forgot to share this. So let me stand over here where you can see me. So you probably learned in other classes that hydrogen bonds are, are relatively weak bonds. Right? So I have my, my two water molecules here. So recall that water molecules have polar bonds. Okay, The oxygen is more electronegative than the two hydrogens. So the electron pairs associate more closely with the oxygen. That puts a partial negative charge on the oxygen, partial positives on the hydrogens, and this allows them to make hydrogen bonds. So I'm sure you've learned in other classes that hydrogen bonds between water molecules are relatively weak and very fleeting as well. So uh, if you're like me and you have a mug of coffee with you today, uh, the water molecules in that coffee, they're constantly forming and breaking hydrogen bonds. So they form, they break, they form, they break, they form, they break. Okay, so in this case, they're relatively weak bonds. They, they don't persist at all. However, if we look at ordered hydrogen bonds, like say between the base pairs of DNA, when we have lots of ordered hydrogen bonds between the base pairs in a double-stranded DNA, they can persist can actually be quite strong. Um, a good analogy I like to use for hydrogen bonding in DNA, uh, it's kind of like Velcro. So, you know, Velcro has little, little loops and, and hooks that hook together. Uh, each individual loop and hook isn't a very strong interaction. When you have lots of them together, however, you know, Velcro can secure your clothing very securely. Okay, that's what's happening in the DNA molecule. We have each individual hydrogen bond is kind of like one loop and hook in the Velcro. When we have lots of them together, those hydrogen bonds can persist and they can actually hold together the DNA molecule, the, the single strands of the DNA molecule quite well. Okay, valence. Oxygen has a valence of two. Uh, so in the, uh, for example, in the case of uh, molecular oxygen, uh, we have 
two oxygen atoms double bonded together. Uh, water molecules, another example. So uh, oxygen has a valence of two. It can form covalent bonds with two things. In the case of water, that's two hydrogens making a water molecule. Uh, Van der Waals forces are limited by the size of the atoms. Uh, hydrogen bonds are more restrictive. Each H of H2O can form one hydrogen bond. Each O of H2O can participate in two. Okay. Um, so in other words, uh, Van der Waals, well, there's two things going on here. So, so first of all, Van der Waals interactions are non-directional. So as long as two atoms come together in close enough proximity, there can be um, a Van der Waals attraction. Okay? It's, it's non-directional. It doesn't matter what orientation they're in. Okay? Also, we can have a, a, a lot of molecules coming together. And so we're only restricted by the size of the atoms. As many atoms as we can cram together, we can get Van der Waals attractions between those atoms. All right. Hydrogen bonding, however, is more restrictive. We can only form two hydrogen bonds if we're talking about a water molecule. And also, these are directional bonds as well. The angle matters. Okay, if the proton donor and acceptors are, uh, the limit is about 30 degrees. If, we are, if, if the proton donors and acceptors are off by about 30 degrees, then we're not going to get a, uh, a hydrogen bond. Okay, so valence, if we're talking covalent bonds, it, it, it depends on the atom. Oxygen has a valence of two. Um, hydrogen bonding in water, again, we're limited to two, and uh, we're also limited by the directionality. Okay, next looking at bond angle. The bond angle between two specific covalent bonds are always the same. Uh, weak bond angles are much more flexible. Okay, so um, what we're looking at in this figure, uh, this is a molecule of methane. So carbon is carbon's kind of unique in that it has a, a valence of four. It can form uh, covalent bonds with with four other things. Um, actually, this is this is one of the reasons why you know living things are carbon based. Carbon makes a, a great building block for for biological molecules. Um, so over here, we're looking at methane. So uh, methane is simply uh, this is CH4. So we have one carbon that's bound to four hydrogens, um, and we can see that this kind of uh, icosahedral arrangement. Of, of bonds. So we have these, these very specific bond angles in, uh, in covalent bonds, which are, which of course are, are the strongest of the chemical bonds. Um, if we look at weak bond angles, they're a lot more flexible. Um, like I said, going back to uh, water molecules, um, again, there is some directionality, there is some restriction, but we can take the proton donor and acceptor and once we bend it to about 30 degrees, that's about where the breaking point is. So there's a, there's a little more flexibility in hydrogen bonds. Um, of course, in Van der Waals interactions, we're, talking, we're only limited by the size of the atoms. So there's, there's really no directionality to speak of there. Freedom of rotation. Uh, single covalent bonds allow free rotation. Double and, and triple covalent bonds are rigid. Uh, bonds with partial double bond characteristics, uh, such as uh, peptide bonds in proteins, uh, are also quite rigid and planar. Uh, weaker ionic bonds do not place such restrictions on orientation of atoms. Okay, so if we were to look at uh, Looking at this monosaccharide here. So carbon six that's attached to the hydroxyl, these two hydrogens, 
Uh, we have a single covalent bond. We can get 180 degrees, 100, pardon me, 360 degrees of rotation around this single covalent bond. Okay, so if you can imagine uh, this group just kind of spinning like a helicopter, uh, it could do that. We can, we, can, we can totally get 100, pardon me, I want to say 180, 360. We can get 360 degrees of rotation um, around that single covalent bond. If we're talking about double covalent bonds or triple covalent bonds, uh, they're planar and rigid. So we don't get that freedom of rotation. Okay, let's go back over here. Okay, so let me show you, uh, let's look at an example of a double bond and a partial double bond. Um, those of you, I think, how many of you are taking, so Hannah and Emily, you're both taking biochem too. So we already went over this in biochem, so this will be uh, familiar to you. So if we look at uh, a peptide bond, Let me get a better this marker's kind of dried out. That one's better. Okay, let's look at a peptide bond. Everybody at uh, the Zoomers can see this just fine. Okay, so we have uh, a couple examples. We have an example of a, a double bond, and we have a partial double bond here as well. But here's a carbonyl. Okay, a carbonyl has a double bond, so that means we, 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 won't, we don't get any rotation around this bond. Okay, this is rigid and planar. We, we get no rotation. This is a peptide bond right here. A peptide bond is actually rigid and planar because of a partial double bond nature. So we're going to get no rotation around that. The reason this is a partial double bond, um, this is actually in a resonance structure with this. So you can see that this is in a resonance structure. In this. So, so this electron pair that's making a double bond between the carbon and the nitrogen is flipping back and forth between the carbon and the oxygen to make a, a carbonyl. Okay, so this gives a peptide bond a, a partial double bond nature. So we're, we can't get any rotation around this peptide bond. Um, even though it looks like a, a single bond, it actually has a, a partial double bond in nature. Okay. Now, on the the other bonds in the peptide backbone are called phi and psi bonds. Okay, these are plain old single covalent bonds. So theoretically, we should be able to get 
a full 360 degree rotation uh, around the phi and the psi lines. And here's the phi and the psi over here as well. Okay. However, take home message here, full 360 degree rotation around single covalent bonds, double covalent bonds, triple covalent bonds, partial double covalent bonds are rigid and planar and we don't get any rotation around that bond at all. Now, again, the whole reason for making this point is to com compare these to the weak chemical bonds, which is really the, the whole point of this chapter is to talk about weak chemical interactions. Um, weaker ionic bonds don't place such rest restriction on the orientation of atoms. Okay, so we'll, we, we don't find any weak chemical interactions that place restrictions on rotation around the bond. They, they can all pretty much freely rotate. Okay, so let's talk about some weak interactions. Van der Waal forces, um, these are the weakest of the weak chemical interactions. Okay, so we're talking about interactions uh, on a scale of one to two kilocalories per mole. Ionic bonds and hydrogen bonds, uh, three to seven kilocalories per mole. Um, in aqueous solution, all molecules can form van der Waals bonds to nearby atoms. Uh, charged or polar molecules can form ionic or hydrogen bonds. The weakest of the weak bonds, so in this case, we're talking uh, about uh, Van der Waals interactions. The weakest of the weak bonds have very, barely more energy than the kinetic energy that exists at room temperature. So we're talking about 0.6 kilocalories per mole. Uh, the strongest of the weak bonds have about 10 times that energy. Uh, weak bonds are constantly breaking and reformed at physiological temperatures. So this gets back to what I was telling you about uh, water molecules. So if you have a cup of coffee or even just a, a bottle of water at room temperature, uh, these bonds are constantly breaking, reforming, breaking, reforming, breaking, reforming. Okay. And actually the uh, ability of water to form hydrogen bonds is responsible for a, a lot of its unique properties that make it a really important, well, it, it is the, not, the most important uh, non-organic nutrient to, to living things. Okay, polar molecules contain covalent bonds over which the electron pair is shared unequally. Okay, so let's talk briefly about polar molecules. All right. Um, okay, I, I think I explained this in um, cell biology last semester. So if, if you're hearing exactly the same thing you heard in cell biology last semester, I apologize, but this is the best way I know to explain uh, polar bonds. So this, let me make sure I'm sharing this with the Zoomers at home. Okay, so I'll post a, a link to this in eCampus if, if I don't remind me, but this is a, just a, a really cool interactive periodic table of the elements that I use in my classes a lot. Um, 
It's called, uh, it's www.ptable.com. Um, I never really figured out if you're supposed to pronounce it p-table or if the p is silent like pterodactyl or whatever, but that doesn't matter. It's p-table.com. Um, one of the cool things you can do is you can check off properties Looks like they changed this. How do I get the properties? Oh, here we go. Properties. All right. So I have hydrogen highlighted. And over here, if we look at properties, the electronegativity I know this is kind of small, but the electronegativity of hydrogen is 2.2. One of the properties on the periodic table is electronegativity. And electronegativity is a measure of how closely an electron pair will associate with a particular atom. Okay? If we have two atoms of equal electronegativity, they're going to share electron pairs equally. That will give us a nonpolar covalent bond. However, if we have a covalent bond between two atoms of differing electronegativity, the electron pair associates more closely with one atom, and that gives us a polar covalent bond. That means that we're going to have partial negative and partial positive charges on the atoms involved in that bond. Okay. Now let's go over here. Okay, now when I highlight oxygen, if you look at electronegativity in the table on the top here, you can see that's 3.44. Okay, so again, 2.2 for hydrogen, 3.44 for oxygen. Okay, so that means Okay, so going back to the water molecule, that means that a polar covalent bond exists between oxygen atoms and hydrogen atoms involved in a covalent bond. Okay. Oxygen having the higher electronegativity, the electron pairs are going to associate more closely with the, with the oxygen. And that's going to give us a partial negative charge on the oxygen, partial positive charge on the hydrogen. And the electrostatic attraction between partial negatives and partial positives um, can give us hydrogen bonds. They can act as proton donors and acceptors in hydrogen bonds. Let's go back and look at the uh, this peptide bond that I drew. So. Let's look at this carbonyl. So we, we already know that there's a difference in electronegativity between the carbon and the oxygen, right? So that's going to put a partial negative charge on this oxygen atom. And the way we denote that is the Greek lowercase letter delta and a minus. Okay, delta minus partial negative charge of the oxygen. Of course, a carbon. Oh, we did oxygen and hydrogen. We didn't do oxygen and carbon. But there is a difference in electronegativity between these two. Okay, oxygen again being more electronegative, carbon being less electronegative. We have a partial positive. Okay. Over here, we have an amino group. Um, Again, there's a difference in electronegativity between nitrogen and hydrogen. Okay, in this case, nitrogen is the more electronegative atom. Hydrogen is the more electropositive. So that's going to put a partial positive on the hydrogen, partial negative on the nitrogen. Okay, so. These polar functional groups, okay? a carbonyl is a polar functional group. Okay? This acts, this can act as a proton acceptor 
in a hydrogen bond. An amino group is a polar functional group. Okay, this hydrogen can act as a proton donor in a hydrogen bond. Okay. And that's, in fact, what we're seeing on this slide. Okay, so what we're looking at here in this slide are is hydrogen bonding uh, between functional groups in the polypeptide backbone of a protein. Okay, so carbonyls can act as proton acceptors in a hydrogen bond with an amino group. And here's a amino group acting as a proton donor. Carbonyl acting as a proton acceptor. And in fact, we just went over this in biochemistry yesterday, for those of you who are taking for both Hannah and, uh, and Emily. Um, these hydrogen bonds uh, helped us stabilize secondary structures in proteins like beta pleated sheets, and in this case, an alpha helix. Okay, so that was hydrogen bonding. Van der Waals bonding arises from induced fluctuating charges caused by the close proximity of two atoms. Okay, so when two atoms are close enough, random fluctuations in the electron cloud uh, can cause a, a very fleeting, very short and very weak attraction between atoms that are close enough. Um, let's go back. Uh, let me draw on the side of the board this time. All right, so let me just draw some very simple atoms. Let's, let's just say uh, helium, just to make it simple. So we have two protons in the nucleus. We have two neutrons. And we have two electrons orbiting in, in, the, orbitals, in the orbitals of this um, nucleus. Over here, let's do another helium. Again, just to keep it simple. Okay, so sometimes the, the random fluctuation of the electrons is, is going to cause a dipole. So let's just say, just by random chance, two of the two electrons of this nearby atom end up over here. Okay, so that's going to cause a little bit of a dipole. So we have uh, a partial positive charge here. Uh, pardon me. So we, we have a positively charged nucleus. So the nucleus will be attracted to the electrons. Okay, so this dipole, this will cause an attraction between the electrons and a, and a neighboring atom. And also, if I were to draw another, uh, another helium atom over here, uh, the electrons will repel, will induce a charge on a nearby electron. So it will repel the electrons. Um, once the electrons are repelled, it will have an attraction to the positively charged nucleus. And uh, again, these attractions, they don't last very long. They're very fleeting. They're very weak. But when we have a lot of them together, they, um, 
they can add up. Okay, so let's go back to Okay, so Van der Waals bonding arises from induced fluctuating charges causing, uh, the, caused by the close proximity of two atoms. Um, here, about 10 angstroms. Again, let me make sure I'm sharing. I'm sharing this. I'm sharing that. Okay, good. 10 angstroms, is, is, we're going to have rather weak Van der Waals interactions because that's rather far apart. Uh, five angstroms. We're going to have uh, very strong Van der Waals interactions. So uh, the nucleus of one atom is going to be attracted to the, uh, the electrons of another and vice versa. Uh, Van der Waals attraction just balanced by repulsive forces owing to uh, the inter interpenetration of the electron shells. Okay, so what's going to happen if the two atoms get too close together? Uh, the positively charged nuclei are going to repel each other. So uh, again, there's kind of a Goldilocks zone there. Uh, too far apart, we're not going to get enough attraction. Uh, too close together, we're going to get repulsion. But if they're in that Goldilocks zone where it's just right, the, um, the, the positively charged nuclei are going to be attracted to the negatively charged electrons of neighboring atom. Uh, and that, that's going to induce a charge uh, nearby atoms, and that will kind of propagate through um, near all the nearby atoms. Okay, hydrogen bonding, we already talked about. A hydrogen bond is formed when a donor hydrogen atom with a partial positive charge interacts with an acceptor molecule, usually oxygen or nitrogen, with a partial negative charge. So here's some more examples. Uh, we already went over hydrogen bonding. So we have uh, so two peptide groups here. So I already talked about the amino groups and the carbonyl groups in the polypeptide backbone. Um, here's a carbonyl. Okay, again, a carbonyl acts as a proton acceptor. So we have a partial negative charge on this carbonyl. Uh, here's an amino group. Okay. Aminos, again, this is a, uh, a polar functional group. We have a partial positive charge on the hydrogen. So again, the amino acts as a proton donor. Uh, carbonyl acts as a proton acceptor, and we can form a hydrogen bond between the two. Um, hydrogen, over here, hydrogen bond between a charged carbonyl group and a hydroxyl group of tyrosine. Um, so here's the high, um, over here, hydroxyl group. Okay, so hydroxyl group is simply oxygen, hydrogen. Okay, so we know from the water molecule that I showed you, this is a polar covalent bond, so we have a partial positive on the hydrogen. Um, carbonyl group. So in the carbonyl group, we have, uh, pardon me, not a carbonyl, this is a carboxyl group. Um, we have a negative charge on the carboxyl group. So the partial positive of the, of the uh, hydroxyl is forming a hydrogen bond with the negatively charged oxygen in this carboxyl group. So again, just to remind you, carboxyl is C carbon, oxygen, oxygen, negative charge. Okay. There's the carbon, oxygen, oxygen, negative charge. Okay, hydrogen bond between two hydroxyl groups. So Again, polar covalent bonds. So we have a, a partial negative on this oxygen, partial positive on this hydroxyl, partial positive on this hydrogen, partial negative on this hydroxyl. So two hydroxyls can form a hydrogen bond. So again, proton donor here, partial negative, proton acceptor here with a partial positive. 
Um, finally, hydrogen bond between a charged amino group and a charged carboxyl group. Uh, again, here's a carboxyl. Um, there's a difference in negativity between nitrogen and hydrogen. We saw that in the, the amino group of the polypeptide backbone. And again, proton donor, proton acceptor, or the hydrogen bond. Okay, looks like we're out of time. Um, unless there's any questions, I'm going to stop here. Uh, remember, lab today, uh, LSB 309, 2 o'clock, and everybody can show up at 2 o'clock because um, there's enough room in there for us, and our class is small enough that we don't have to worry about splitting up for social distancing. All right, unless there's any questions from Zoom, I'm going to stop the Zoom meeting, and I'll see you guys at... Two and else three or nine.